Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space News with me. Every single Monday I post these videos containing all the latest and greatest updates regarding SpaceX's Starship development, the most interesting launch events from the past week and everything else regarding Space News and Space Flight and all that good stuff. Bit of a dramatic week this one, from launch failures, scrubs and debris warnings, but with a couple of success stories as well. This episode was sponsored by Squarespace, the world's greatest website builder. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's begin with Starship updates. On Tuesday, we were all treated to another Booster 7 Raptor Spin Prime test, and from our observations, this looked like it could have been all 33 Raptor engines. Taking a closer look at the sequence here, it looks like the Booster 7 startup sequence involves 16 different groupings. Things begin with spin-up of the central three engines, and then the outer engines spin up in opposite pairs in sequence until all 33 are lit. Starbase FR whipped up this quick animation to show what this looks like, which I hope is a bit easier to understand than a verbal description. On Friday, we saw another spin prime test from Booster 7, this time with what we believe to be just seven of the engines, so it's looking like the next static fire on the cards will be with seven Raptors. Take a look at this picture from Starbase Surfer. As you can see, Ship 25 is now stacked inside the high bay, and that heat shield is looking great. If I'm not mistaken, it looks far more complete than Ship 20's heat shield was when it was first stacked, and it also looks a lot further along than Ship 24's when it was first rolled out as well. I'm hoping we won't have to wait too long before we get to see Ship 25 out in the open so that we can all bask in its unoccluded greatness. Its companion, Booster 8, is also standing pretty proud and tall as well. Now, Booster 8 isn't the only super heavy in the Mega Bay. Booster 9 is rapidly rising as well. It looks like SpaceX are continuing their new double stacking technique with super heavy construction. Booster 9's upper liquid oxygen tank was lifted with its aft section dangling below it so that SpaceX can simultaneously weld multiple sections in a single pass, a technique we first saw with the stacking of Booster 9's methane tank back in July. Ship 25 and Booster 8 may be the last of their kind for a little while. Future starships are looking like they're not going to have heat shielding. Ship 26's nose cone was completely stripped of its TPS tiles and its barrel segments are looking pretty bare as well. Now check out this picture from Nick Ansuini. It's a fairly innocuous photo of the Star Factory building, but look a little bit closer and you'll see that there is now Starship hardware inside. We believe this to be the payload bay of an upcoming Starship prototype and it's the first time that we've seen the Star Factory building used to house Starship hardware. Long term, of course, this building will completely replace the iconic tents at Starbase. What's the bets on this barrel segment getting heat shielding? I'm guessing it's probably going to be another expendable Starship variant. I've mentioned these things for the past couple of episodes now and uh, earlier in this video, but to quickly elaborate on what this means, we think SpaceX are just going to fly Starship in a first stage recovery only configuration initially, a bit like a giant Falcon 9, just so that they can get Starlink V2 operational. It's too early to say if they'll still be installing the body flaps on these starships, or if they'll look more like this interpretation created by Sushi Fox Studios, which is literally just a silver bullet with a hatch. Starlink V2 will only be able to fly on Starship because the satellites are just too big for any other launch vehicle. You can see in this animation, in fact, they take up a considerable amount of square space, which incidentally is the same as the name of the amazing website builder that has sponsored today's episode of Space This Week. Guys, let's make things clear. If you're a small business owner, content creator, charity, musician, graphic designer, or really anyone at all trying to carve their way through today's modern era, then you need a website. And that's where Squarespace come in. People think about building websites and they conjure up images like this. Man, what? But this couldn't be further from the case when it comes to building a website with Squarespace. Just tell Squarespace what you want your website to be about, be it a portfolio, storefront, non-profit, or just a website dedicated to your cat. Then choose from a huge range of templates to find the perfect springboard for your site, and then get going. You can customize every aspect of your website to your heart's content to make something truly personalized to you. And no, you'll never see a screen like this. Building a website with Squarespace is not much more than just clicking, dragging, and dropping. The easiest thing about Squarespace though, the sell. It's free to set your website up and get everything ready at squarespace.com. And it's only when you're ready to launch that you need to pay anything. And when that time comes, you can save yourself 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain by heading to squarespace.com slash Click that link in the description and begin your journey expanding your brand to the masses online. Go on, 
do it now. Anyway, after that subtle sponsorship read, quickly returning to Starlink V2, Starship Gazer caught some shots of workers tending to the Starlink dispenser door on Thursday morning, and it looks like they've added reinforcement around the opening. It's believed that the eventual flight of Ship 24 will not only be a test flight of the vehicle itself, but it will deploy the first ever Starlink V2s, or at least a mass simulator boilerplate version of the Starlink V2s. Quite a while ago, we saw SpaceX hooking up Ship 24 to the Starlink loader. This is obviously going to be a much cooler cooler payload than what Ship 20 and Booster 4 were going to carry, which was of course uh, a wheel of cheese. <laughs> Though I guess there is a non-zero chance that Ship 24 will still carry some cheese in honour of Falcon 1's test payload. I bet you could fit a couple of baby bells in that opening. <laughs> now over in Florida, Aaron Jones captured these photos while on tour of the Kennedy Space Center. That definitely looks like a booster quick disconnect hood being delivered to Pad 39A. SpaceX are certainly moving fast with the construction of their Floridian Starbase launch site. Spaceflight Now captured this footage of the ninth and final segment of the gigantic Starship launch tower being transported to the pad before being stacked onto the tower, bringing this beast to full height. Now it was at this point in the video that I hoped to discuss SpaceX's latest Starlink mission, which was supposed to launch on the 16th of September, but was unfortunately aborted due to unfavourable weather off the Florida coast. It was rescheduled to the 17th of September, but was unfortunately cooled off once again due to poor weather conditions. The new launch time will be the early hours of today, which will be after I've made this video unfortunately, so I obviously can't say for sure if the third time was the charm for this mission. I'll drop a pinned comment down below for you to check out to find out more and hey while you're down there don't forget to like this video if you are enjoying it and hit subscribe so that you never miss my monday space news updates now we have an interesting launch to discuss from blue origin this was new shepherd mission flight 23 which wasn't flying any astronauts but instead it had 36 commercial payloads from academia research institutions and students from across the globe the launch initially went well but look what happened at around max q which of course is the point in a rocket's flight where the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. The footage here shows the exhaust becoming engine rich, which happens when debris enters the combustion chamber. And then moments later, we saw a major engine failure and the rocket began tipping over to the side, at which point the launch escape system of the capsule activated and pulled the capsule away. That's a lot of power being generated by that launch escape engine. This thing in the middle of the capsule isn't a table, that's the engine that fires during launch abort. As for the booster, as of me writing the script for this video, no footage of the booster's fate has surfaced really, and it's likely that we'll never see any footage of it at this point. It almost certainly wasn't blown out of the sky by a flight termination system though, because the live stream appears to display telemetry data right up until the moment of landing, or I guess crashing would be a more fitting description. All we really know is Blue Origin posted on Twitter that they were responding to an issue at the launch site shortly after the engine failure. The issue there probably being a crashed rocket. Now it's worth noting that this is not the same booster that Blue Origin use for their crewed flights. Blue Origin actually have three New Shepard rockets, although one of them has been retired and put on display, so I guess they technically only have two, or had two. <laughs> the rocket that crashed last week was New Shepard 3, which is not the same booster that Blue Origin used to fly humans, that's New Shepard 4. When we'll see another launch of the remaining New Shepard booster remains to be seen though. New Shepard 4 uses the same BE3 engine as the New Shepard 3 vehicle, so this launch failure will likely ground the rocket for the foreseeable future while Blue Origin figure out what went wrong here. Now we saw a successful launch from Rocket Lab on the 15th of September. A trusty Electron rocket launched from Launch Complex 1 from Rocket Lab's launch center at the Mahia Peninsula. And this was the second mission of a bulk buy of three Electron launches by Synspective, a radar imaging company founded in Japan. The mission was a complete success, and with its completion, Rocket Lab reached quite a few significant milestones. This was Rocket Lab's 30th Electron launch, its 300th Rutherford engine, and the single satellite delivered to orbit brought Rocket Lab's tally of satellites delivered to orbit to 150. Congratulations to the folks at Rocket Lab for another successful launch. Here's to the next 150 satellites. <laughs> On the 13th of September, a Chinese Long March 7A launched the Zongzing 1E satellite from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site. 
the Long March 7A is a pretty cool looking vehicle. I guess its bigger size and four auxiliary boosters is a more interesting sight than a single core rocket like the Long March 4C, which is a vehicle I often talk about in these videos. It is a shame that the launch happened at night though, so that you can't really see anything. <laughs> the Zongzing 1E satellite is a telecommunication satellite designed to, according to official sources, provide users with high quality voice, data, radio and television transmission services. This vague description, coupled with a lack of any real information about the satellite and lack of images of it, suggests that the primary customers of this mission are the military. In apparent Chinese tradition, this is another Long March launch that sent debris hurtling back down from space on an uncontrolled trajectory, this time sparking warnings from authorities in the Philippines of the potential danger to ships and aircraft from falling rocket parts. Several space agencies, including NASA, have criticized the Chinese space agency in the past, asserting that they failed to meet responsible standards regarding their space debris. And I can't say I disagree with this. In slightly more positive news from the Chinese space agency, the Taikonauts aboard the Tiangong space station successfully completed their second extravehicular activity of the Shenzhou 14 mission on the 17th of September. Taikonauts Kai Zuze and Chen Dong returned to the Wentian laboratory module and during their spacewalk they installed various equipment to the station and verified their extravehicular rescue capabilities. Over at Laon Aerospace, another successful Juno mission was pulled off. You can watch that video on my channel right now. And make sure you're subscribed because I've got another epic Kerbal Space Program mission coming this Saturday. And all of this content was, of course, made possible by the list of names on screen. They're my generous Patreon donors and channel members, and it's their continued generosity that allows me to keep making these videos. If you want to sign up, then you know how. But otherwise, there are two video suggestions on screen for my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. And yes, one of them should be my latest KSP video, so do check it out if you haven't. And I really, really hope you enjoy uh, the Kerbal video coming on Saturday. I work quite hard on it and I think it's a good one. So yes, that's it. Goodbye.